Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode number 91 of Confessions of a Market Maker. I'm your co-host, Ray, a.k.a. All Day Ray, a.k.a. Larry Zonka. And I'm joined here by my gregarious co-host, former market maker of 20 years and current day retail trader, the man who brought over 200 companies public. That's enough worthless paper to upset environmental conservation groups. <laughs> The Silverback of House Street, JJ. How's it going? Good, brother. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Very excited for our guest today. Mm. He has made trading and studying the markets his life work for over 40 years. He is the author of two seminal books on market profile, Mind Over Markets and Markets in Profile. Our guest has been a member of the Chicago Board of Trade as well as a member of the Chicago Board Options Exchange and Senior Executive Vice President of the CBOE during his formative years. You may know him as the godfather of Market Profile, Jim Dalton. Mr. Dalton, how's it going today? It's going really good. <laughs> Excellent. We're, you know, we're very honored to have you here. You've had many years in the market. Um, very well, you were very you were very gracious. You said 40 and it's actually 50, but thank you. Oh, it's 50. Oh. <laughs> well, even better, even more uh, wisdom to bestow upon us. Um, yeah, I'd just like to start the conversation, uh, Mr. Dalton, just, you know, at the genesis for you. Uh, how did you get into markets? How did it all start? Oh, I came out of the Marine Corps and I went to work for IBM and number one salesman of the first year and a half and I hated every single day of it. I left and I went to work for uh, Merrill Lynch and I didn't really care for some of the research. I started doing my own research and uh, they took all my commissions away. So I left and went to another brokerage firm and uh, that was you know, much more suitable for me, but I got involved in over-the-counter options and very interested in it. Then I went back and was uh, moved to Payne Weber it was Payne Weber then, it's UBS Financial Services now, in Chicago, which was the largest uh, brokerage office under one roof at the time. And I was running an institutional options desk. From there, I got a call from Joe Sullivan, who was the initial you know, president of the Chicago Board Options Exchange, and asked me if I would be interested in joining them. And uh, I said at the time, they, they couldn't pay enough at the time. So I worked behind the scenes for a few months until they got you know, better off the ground. And then I went to work uh, full-time at the exchange. And of course, that just absolutely turned my life around. Uh, Jim, uh, for, uh, for the listeners, can you give us just a context, like what time, uh, you know, what, what uh, yeah, time period was this? When did you, when you start? Well, the, the exchange opened April 26 of 1973, and um, I joined them probably October of that year. Okay. All right. Excellent. Um, I want to I, I want to ask you. You said you you came out of the the Marine Corps. Obviously, very um, di uh, disciplined environment, um, hard environment to even just get into the Marines. Uh, do you think that background? Um, maybe some of the discipline you learned from there helped you with trading, uh, getting acclimated to trading? Oh, I suspect it did. Uh, I'd come from a small farm family in Illinois. Um, my sister and I were the first two ever to go to college from the grade school that, that I was at. And we were, you know, kind of a ragtail group of people about uh, 10 miles from, you know, the really where the center was in the high school. So the Marine Corps did... Uh, College gave me discipline, but so did so did the Marine Corps. But I think what the Marine Corps did more than anything else, it made me lose any uh, timidness I had towards uh, people that were older than I was or, you know, better off financially. Uh, I, I just felt that I had a right to talk to anyone. And that was very, very helpful. Very good. And we, we thank you for your service, too, as thank well. Thank you. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, just a reminder to listeners, uh, if you'd like to join a supportive and professional community of traders, 
you can join us at microefutures.com. Uh, JJ, I just want to ask him one more question, then I'll let you jump in here. No problem. Um, no problem. Uh, Mr. Dolan, uh, I'm just curious. Um, yeah, it's Jim, please. Okay, Jim. Sorry, you know. I know I'm 82, but I'm still Jim. <laughs> I, I always just want to be respectful, you know. You, you only use you only use Mister for older people. Okay, all right, all right, <laughs> Jim. Jim, it is Jim. Um, I, I always like asking the guests um, about the initial learning curve for trading for themselves. Uh, did you have any initial struggles? Things you had to overcome at first? You know, how was just the you know the initial trading period for you? I'm not sure it's over yet. <laughs> mm, yeah, I mean. It's a, I mean as you well know, trading is a constant struggle. Uh, we go through periods where, you know, we're in tune with the market and we, you know, have trouble doing anything wrong. And then we go through periods where we get sideways with the market and it become very difficult. Uh, we always say that it's, you know, it's a combination of market understanding and self-understanding. And I think the, uh, the hardest part for myself and I suspect for many traders is the self-understanding. Uh, it's just, it's hard to stay balanced all the time. It's hard to continually fight the biases that you get. And particularly at short-term trading, which is, you know, what I do is short-term trading, which it was on the floor and which it is for what I do right now. You have to always be aware that your long-term economic opinion will kill you. So much of short-term trading has to do with inventories getting too long or too short. And it really, if you come in and you're trying to use your economic views or your longer term opinions on the market, it's going to be a very difficult time for short term trading. And I, you know, I make sure that people do understand I'm talking about, you know, trades of day trades up to two or three days, no longer. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you know, JJ, we, we've talked, I know I've talked about this a little bit um, on the podcast, you know, Jim, like earlier this year, I was trying to I don't want to say like, I've always, you know, been of the same mind as that, like, you know, cause I'm a short-term trader. Don't listen to, to the news. I, I started trying to incorporate a little bit, just totally threw me out of whack. Like you said, the, the biases and stuff, but yeah, JJ, go ahead. You can take oh, it over. No, oh, thanks. I, I'm so, uh, I'm really excited. Thank you for joining us, Jim. I'm, uh, I have so much to thank you for and, and to be grateful uh, to you for, because Definitely without you, I would have not um, continued in retail trading. I, I came off of... Uh, so you're you know, going to blame me for that? <laughs> I was... There was, there was no, seriously, I, I, well, I started retail trading after having a heart attack uh, to do, try and do something a little less stressful than, you know, uh, work out paper for promoters and run markets. And my gosh, uh, boy, did, was I in for a, for, a, for a surprise because I thought it'd be a walk in the park. And it is completely 100% the opposite. I didn't know how to read candle charts because for me, a chart was like a party invitation that I would send out to retail investors so they would come and buy my stock. You know, we'd build a chart. So I didn't know how to trade candles and I didn't know anything about that. And I was so frustrated. And then I found Peter Resnicek. I stumbled upon him and then stumbled and then he led me to you. And I think, you know, I used to go to sleep listening to your um, YouTubes and just, and structure just completely changed my life. Um, and it, it allowed me to actually, you know, use the concepts that I had learned in making markets uh, to actually being able to trade them successfully as a retail trader. And if not for you and the work that you and Mr. Stadelmeyer did, my goodness, I, I would be, I'd be, you know, back to, you know, humping deals again. But so I'm very, you know, this is probably, uh, this is like the most exciting podcast for me because you know, you're pretty much the reason uh, why I was able to, you know, build a second life in a career. So thank you very much for that. Well, and thank, we're... thank you, and thank you. I know many uh, clients have come to us, and uh, they've referenced uh, you as being the referral. So I am very appreciative of that. You said that you, you know, you you had a heart attack. One of the things about three three and a half years ago, I had a uh, stroke. I had brain surgery, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I was okay after the brain surgery, but the following morning I woke up and had a stroke. I could not move a toe or a finger on my right side. And I had to uh, relearn any, everything from, you know, sitting down, putting little pegs in, in the holes, you know, square pegs yeah. and square holes and pick up sticks and all that kind of stuff. But it really was a 
a, a tremendous benefit because you reevaluate everything. Yeah. And one of the things that helped me is I do a lot of studying and reading on intuition and the brain and how the brain works. And the same type of thing you use to recover from a stroke, it's the same kind of discipline and mental attitude you need to be a successful trader. It's, it's difficult, but mental toughness is one of the most important things you can ever, ever deal with. So I, I'm actually very thankful uh, to that because it did it uh, it set me uh, in a better direction. Yeah, I am too because uh, you know the what I was doing with and the partners I was I was working with were, you know that that business was going downhill and uh, you know how people cling on to a to a, a you know something and this allowed me it forced me to do something completely new. So um, now I'm. I was trained by floor traders, you know, when they were coming off the floor in Vancouver. So I completely took to the way you instructed and you were the first person to ever talk about inventory. You know, I had looked around uh, YouTube and things like that. And, you know, and I talk about inventory um, and people are like, what's inventory. And, you know, so let, let me, let me get, you know, kind of tell our readers or our listeners what, what inventory is, because, you know, you mentioned earlier inventory is why the market's moving back and forth. Um, if you could just kind of give them a little uh, background on that. Well, I find the simplest thing when I'm talking to individual traders is, is pretend you own a retail store and your retail store, you know, sells widgets. Mm -hmm. um, if you have too many widgets, you're going to have to lower the price in order to uh, get those widgets out of stock. If all your widgets are, are bought very quickly, you're going to be short inventory and you're going to have to go out and acquire additional inventory. If you think of trading and think of inventory very much like having a retail store, it makes the concept a little easier. I don't know why people get hung up with the word inventory, but as I say, if you're an, an individual and you buy a stock or you buy a future, you're long one future. Mm -hmm. If you buy um, two futures, you're long two. If you sell two, you're short two. And I think it's, it's a very simple way to think about it. And then you say, okay, you take and think about how you view inventory. Then you reflect on what everybody else is doing out there. And you're saying, wait a minute, are some of these short-term traders getting too long in inventory or are they getting too short? And I'm sure you remember experiences on the floor you know, you hear the term, the term top step all the time, and, but you always had in the crowd a couple of very large traders. But the majority of the floor was made up by an awful lot of small traders. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't uncommon for those small traders all to be leaning the wrong way. It's like the Pied Piper. They mm -hmm. follow each other just like a lot of traders do. And all of a sudden, the largest trader in the, in the crowd would stand up. And, you know, if you put your hand straight out in front of you, Yep. the palms facing you, you're buying. So if he sensed that the floor, the little traders on the floor were short, he'd stick his hands out in front of him and he would start to buy. That would start the scramble and the, you know, yep. covering their inventory. Yep. And as it got to a crescendo, his, his palms would then go to facing the crowd, which means selling, and he'd sell into them. Well, yep. that was a, a kind of a small example, but that happens, that happens in the trading crowds all day long. Inventory yeah. gets too long, inventory gets too short. And then we get a counter auction or a correction. You talked about overnight inventory, I believe earlier. Yeah. We find that you know about 70% of the time, the traders from overnight get it wrong and you get a counter auction or a correction relative to overnight inventory. Right. And I think the reason for that is that so many of the traders overnight are smaller size traders and they have more of a tendency to, you know, to follow the crowd. Mm -hmm. The larger, more institutional type traders don't trade overnight because the market's too thin. They exactly. get very exasperated when they go to buy a normal size and it's, you know, it's spread out over many ticks. So yeah. the overnight inventory is generally smaller traders and they have a tendency to get the wrong way about 70% of the time. Cool. What is your um, what is your take on the markets today? With now, I've only been around since '93, so it's a fraction of the time you have. But 
I'm noticing these huge trading ranges that we're getting. And, you know, and then I look at, you know, some of the leading stocks and I see that they trade maybe 10% of their float in average daily trading volume. Are you noticing that there's kind of a, a lack of trading volumes and liquidity these days that's causing these large ranges? What's your take on that? Well, I, I think what's what's going on, and I've talked to a couple of uh, uh, clients that run large institutional desks, and I break the market down into three categories. It's not that simple, but I call them the, the daytime frame traders. Mm -hmm. Then above that, I call the fast money traders. Those are the hedge funds, the hedge funds, the family offices, large pools of capital, yeah. highly leveraged. And then the long-term investment buy and hold accounts. Yeah. The longer term buy and hold accounts and the really large traders are fairly well hedged against what they see as an upcoming recession in the, um, in the market or in the economy and more downward action in the market. So they're basically out of the market from what I can see. Mm -hmm. And that leaves most of the trading to the daytime frame traders and this cadre of very fast money traders, highly leveraged. And I yeah, think right. that really is what a part of what you attribute this volatility to. Additionally, when the pandemic came around, we had an influx of, I don't know how many, but I know it was huge, traders that had never traded before. Very you know, true. we had breaks in the market some years back and we lost a lot of individual traders. And when that happens, you know, they get hurt and it usually takes a new generation to come along and enter the market. Well, I think mm -hmm. that new generation came in and uh, very excited. They had some money from the pandemic and they weren't doing anything else. And I think that also added to the, uh, to the market. Interesting. That's interesting. It's, um, I, I, I love hearing someone who's, who's had so much inform, you know, so much experience who've seen change, you know, from the markets in the seventies and the eighties and the nineties. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm just surprised now that from when I started in, in 93 and got on a desk in 96 to how much it's changed, you know, we, we were telephone traders, you know, right, right after the floors were closing down. So I heard a rumor that when you first started teaching, were you teaching floor traders screens? Is that how you started? Yeah, absolutely. My my largest audience to begin with was the uh, New York Mercantile Exchange. Oh, okay. And the, the message that I have tried to deliver over the years is the tremendous advantage screen-based trading can provide for an individual. It gives you a clarity and a transparency that you never had. When we were on the floor, you know, sound was a real benefit. Mm -hmm. you, you as if the markets are going to new highs and you hear the uh, the noise level rise, you know we're going higher. You go to new highs and you hear the noise level start to dissipate, you know that that's over and you start to you know go the other way on the on the trade. Well, when I was the president of a discount futures brokerage firm in Chicago, I used to laugh because people would call and say, "I'll open an account with you if you tell me what the floor traders are doing." <laughs> and I'd look at the president of the firm and I'd say, "Hey, Mike." This, this person's going to be a credit risk because they don't understand that's a totally different business. Mm -hmm. But there was an advantage to being on the floor. And, you know, when the market would open in the morning, you know, we may try and uh, bid it up a little bit or offer it down until we kind of found a range where there were, you know, longer term buyers, at least buyers longer than the day time frame and sellers longer than the day time frame. And we try and trade in between. Now, yeah. I mean, sometimes that gets... Uh, changed quickly, but you know it was what you did. But you you listened on the floor to the noise. When the uh, we went to screen based trading, now you can see what is going on. You see that you see the trades, you see the market, and I think it provides a transparency and a clarity that we never had before. But okay. unfortunately, I never I don't hear people teaching that. I still hear people teaching a lot of the things that were on the floor, pivots and things like that, that I really don't think are effective for uh, screen-based trading. That that totally makes sense. That totally makes sense. That's why I've, I've you know, structure has actually helped me learn how to, to look at candles 
you know, um, and, uh, and apply it that way. And it's, it's really helped me with my teaching, but it, you know, it all started out with structure and uh, just out of curiosity, do you still uh, talk to uh, Mr. Stallemeyer? Is he, we no, never hear actually, about him. I was, I was talking to uh, uh, an individual that has a, uh, a hedge fund out in Los Angeles last night uh, as a client. And I, I said, have you, uh, have you heard anything from Pete? He said, no, he said, I haven't. He said, I used to go to his ranch and, but I don't, I have no idea what he's, what he's doing these days. Okay. Um, so no, I don't have any idea. Oh, okay. Just, just, uh, one of the, you know, the questions that somebody was asking me to ask if anybody's ever heard from him lately. Um, the other thing is, uh, one of the guys in the room wanted me to ask, um, do you still look at New York stock exchange volume as opposed to contract volume in the futures? I know that when I was, you know, starting to look at uh, your videos that back in, you know, back five years ago, that was your thing. Yes, I, I do. I, I, I use both. The, the three components that make up the structure of the market are time, price, and volume. Mm -hmm. And of course, you know, there's so many different ways to hide volume anymore. Mm -hmm. So the best way we, we have is the volume on the NYSE. Now, I'm not saying it's a good source, but I'm saying it's the best source that we have available to us. And I only apply volume when it's clear what direction the market was trying to, to go in any one day. So if the market was rotational back and forth, I'm not gonna look at the volume. But if it's a trend day up or a trend day down or a strong day up or down, I do look at the volume to see on a relative basis, particularly over the last 10 days, you know, are we going up and are we getting more volume? Are we going up and getting less volume? Mm -hmm. Obviously, if, if it's healthy, you want, to, you want higher prices to bring in more volume, more mm -hmm. activity. The same as you would expect in any business. Exactly. Now, on a short-term basis, I keep my profiles, I have two profiles of the same day. The one is condensed on the left and on the mm -hmm. right, I have it split out. And I have the volume next to this to the profile because I want to see if a market's going higher. I want to see what kind of volume uh, there is as we're going higher. Futures volume, yeah. for example, uh, today is nine eight nine seven. Yesterday morning, the market had a ended up the day with a very sharp, sharp covering uh, rally. The market had got excessively short, and I think the uh, yeah. You know, a, a break in oil back down to the $80 level kind of sparked that sharp covering. But early in the morning, there was a sharp run to the upside. And the high price had about 4,000 cars on it. Yep. And when I looked at that, I said, okay, higher prices were bringing in more activity. Yeah. And the market went down, it went down to the, to the settle, and then it rallied and took that out. But the fact that what you really, if you think economically, if it's strong, you want to see higher prices bringing more activity. If it's relatively weak, you want higher prices to cut off activity. You mentioned Peter Resnicek before. Peter came up with the word taper. Mm -hmm. And basically what he was saying, say the market went up. And as he told me one day, you can almost do an automatic short. The market goes up and let's say there's, you know, 100 contracts on the high. Well, yeah. higher prices were shutting off activity. Yeah. Yesterday, when we had almost 4,000 contracts early morning high, higher prices were not cutting off activity. And exactly. it was pretty clear that the market had good odds of coming back through that, which it did. So to answer your basic question, yes, I still pay attention to the NYSE volume, but on a uh, short-term basis, I look at the futures volume on the half-hour basis to see if higher prices are bringing in more activity or less. Good stuff. I'll, uh, I'll ask another question and we'll let Ray jump in. Um, you know, throughout my career, I always had mentors. Um, you know, I consider you one of my virtual mentors because, um, you know, I wasn't actually in your presence, so you couldn't hit me with a phone when I did something silly. But, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, were there any mentors in, in your career that, that stood out that, uh, you know, um, the answer to that is absolutely positively no. Really? And, and that's why if you take a look at some of the, the things that we talk about that I don't think you hear any place else. We talk about poor highs, 
poor highs meaning there's no excess mm -hmm. weak highs meaning the high was exactly at you know some prominent reference um structure half back on a uh on a day or we talk about on a trend day uh the afternoon pullback high or rally low there there's probably about 15 or 20 terms that we use that are terms that i learned on my own and i think i was benefited by the fact that i didn't have a, a mentor now it took me a lot of money and a lot longer to learn yeah. but almost everything is through observation and i think one of the great strong points that Pete Stoudemire uh, had was the ability to look and observe. And I think that's, uh, as I think I picked up on that, and that's what we try and do is to, to get an idea from observation what is really going on in the market. That, that totally makes sense. Yeah, I was just curious if there were any characters in, you know, in your institutional days that, uh, but <laughs> I guess not. All right, Ray, go ahead. Yeah, it was, there's a lot. There's a lot to be said for um, you know, Jim, like you said, you know, um, you take your lumps maybe at first, but there's a lot to be said for a self-taught or self-learning and going through it that way. Um, you, you mentioned Peter Stottlemyer. Um, um, I you know, I think it would be good for the listeners and, and even for myself. Um, you know, the advent of market profile um, and how it came about and how this you know became a thing. Well. The Board of Trade was was going electronic. And Pete, you know, had a degree in statistics from Stanford. And he started working in conjunction with the Board of Trade to develop a way to visualize and see the market once we went to screen-based trading. Okay. Now, I really wasn't part of what he was doing early on. We had a mutual friend that was on the grain floor. And one day, because, you know, I had done a lot with options, I had my desk up in the Board of Trade building and I had all these uh, charts out in distribution curves. And my friend walked in, he said, oh, he said, you must be a, a friend of Stoudemire's and uh, the market profile. I said, no, I didn't, hadn't heard of Pete and I didn't know what the market profile was. He said, can I bring Pete up to meet you? And I said, sure. So Pete came up, uh, you know, a few days later and Within about four to five minutes, I understood the significant observation he had made. And that was that, you know, being a stat major, how do you form a distribution curve? You need a constant and a variable. And he understood the idea that you could make time a constant, a half an hour between eight and 8.30 is the same as between nine and 9.30. And, you know, once you had a constant, then you could compare price the variable to that constant. And that gives you a distribution curve, which is the market profile. As I tell people, I'm not a profile trader. I use the market profile to organize the market's continuous two-way auction process, which is what scientists have done for years. The better you have the data organized, the easier it is to tease important or pertinent information from that data. So right. Pete, Pete, Pete looked at me and. Um, he said, you get it. And I said, yeah, I said, you, you've done something tremendous. He walked out to the elevator and he came back. He said, you want to sponsor my first book? I said, how much? He said, 10,000. And I wrote him out a check for, for 10,000, which then allowed me to, you know, well, I started going to his classes and really learning the profile. And of course, as you reference, as we started, I then wrote my own books and uh, several of the, the early concepts, um, I, I have jettisoned because I found that they didn't hold the significance that I thought they did as time went on. But what has remained constant is the importance of time, price, and volume, the three components that make up any transaction that is financial in nature. Yeah, incredible. Yeah, awesome. Uh, Jim, we, we spoke to um, Paula Webb um, last podcast who worked with uh, Mark Douglas on a lot of his work on his trading psychology work. And we, we had a conversation around uh, her working with newer traders as to, you know, as opposed to when she first started. Um, I'm interested in maybe some of your experiences. Um, have you noticed a difference working with newer traders as opposed to when you first started this? 
Not really. I think they, uh, I would always rather work with a newer trader. Hmm. It is very difficult to work with someone that has learned and been taught a lot of things that I just really don't think are valid. Hmm. Part of learning to be a trader is the unlearning. And the unlearning is the more difficult uh, part. I've got an individual right now was a, a, a very prominent lawyer with a large oil and gas firm. And he decided he wanted to be a, a trader. And he left the law firm after I think 16 years, put funds aside for, you know, so he and his family could live for a number of years. And he, he, he said, I came to you because you said, if we really worked hard, if we were fortunate, we might break even at the end of two years. And he said, nobody else says that. I said, well, that's really what it is. It takes an awful lot to learn about the markets and learn about yourself. And I was talking to him a couple of days ago. He may be the best student I've ever had because one, he learned what it takes to be a top professional in one field. So he knows it's not just a desire. You have to put the effort in. Most people won't put the efforts, the effort in. They think they think they want to do it. They say they want to do it. But as you well know, when it comes down to what you have to do mm -hmm. day after day after day in order to make a living, which is where well, this is a profession, most people won't do it. Yeah. How about, Jim, um, let's say, for instance, um, you know, I, and I'm thinking around, you know, we have social media. Uh, we have a lot of different influences on, on a newer trader coming into the markets now. How about a newer trader now versus maybe like, let's say in the 90s or 80s, or when you were talking to someone there, do you see any differences working with people there or, or not really? I really don't. Okay. You know, I, I just, uh, and, and maybe I'm not giving you a, a great answer because that's not something I've focused on, Yeah. but it's not something that just naturally comes front and center. I mean, I, I'll equate it a lot of times to you know, learning to play baseball. You can sit in the uh, in the bleachers and you can talk and talk and talk about that player this and that player that, but go down on the field, it's it's totally different. Pick up the bat, you know, and you got a milliseconds for the ball to leave the pitcher to the plate at 100 miles an hour and, you know, a couple milliseconds, it's by you. That doesn't come from sitting in the bleachers. You have to be there day after day. And I think that's the same thing with, with trading. There's so much emotion involved in, in the trading. And then you're so influenced by, you know, the people on the news and everything else. And I tell short-term traders, remember, they may be looking out for months or years. You're looking at it today. And I think that's the, it's more the attitude of a, of a floor trader years ago, that the really good floor traders understood you were dealing with the here and now. And it's, that's, that's hard. It's hard to keep the concentration. Sure. Sure it is. All right, Jim, I want to, I want to ask you about uh, rules in trading or rule-based trading. Uh, I know you have um, maybe issues with people who have rules-based, but don't contextual, contextualize the rules in their trading. I just kind of want to get your thoughts around this topic and, and also ask you like personally, in your own trading, do you have like soft rules? We don't call them rules. We call them guidelines. Okay. I mean, it's, it's, not, it's not fixed. I mean, the markets, there's too many irregularities in the market, I think, to operate consistently with rules. But we do have guidelines. For example, if the market has a spike, which is a late price move either up or down, we have spike guidelines. Mm -hmm. If the market says spike to the upside, so the one guideline would be where the spike, spike, spike started from, that would be your support. If the market opens within the spike, it's showing it's being accepted. If it opens above the spike, it's showing that the spike didn't go high enough to cut off you know, the, um, the buying. And if it opens below the spike, it shows it went high enough to cut off the uh, the buying and attract the seller. So they're guidelines to have you have a better understanding of what was going on rather than just the price opens in the morning. Oh, now what do I do? Uh, so we do have that. We have, we say the two most important concepts we deal with are excess 
and balance. Excess you know, would be the end of one auction and the beginning of a new auction where you have single prints on the high or the low and balance when the market comes into balance. When you come out of balance, that usually is a pretty good opportunity. And we have guidelines for that. Go with a breakout from balance, fade a breakout from balance that doesn't hold because then the odds are you're gonna to trade to the opposite end. And, you know, it's those just guidelines, but the market, you, you have to be mentally tough and be able to make adjustments on the fly because you never know when there's a new a news announcement coming out. Um, yes, this morning, uh, the, the ninth, Powell came out and was speaking. Of course, the market, uh, he didn't say anything new. He said what he, what he said at Jackson Hole a few days ago, but the market immediately sold off. Well, they got themselves too short and before long, we were back at making new highs for the last several days. Now, as we're talking here, they've taken all of that back. But, you know, that's the craziness that goes on in the uh, in the markets. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like that word better guidelines that, that does that, that makes more sense because you, you see people who. Uh, yeah, it gets very fixed on the rules and you have to have that level of fluidity. Um, I really I really like that. Um, and Jim, I, I want to bring it back to when you were discussing about the uh, the brain and that um, and um, just the function in, in having our brains, you know, uh, work as optimally as possible for us. I think one of I read one of your favorite books was Mozart's Brain and the Mozart Fighter and Pilot. The, Mozart and the Fighter Pilot. Right. I, I I haven't got a chance to read it. It's on my list. Um, I know because you recommended it. Uh, I'm sure this would be of interest to the readers. You mind just uh, telling us why this is one of your favorite books? Well, as you can appreciate, a fighter pilot has to make some very quick decisions, and uh, but do the same thing in trading. You can't you can't fly a jet airplane, you know, by the rules. You have to make adjustments. I mean, you may be attacked. There may be wind. There may be weather. There may be other you know planes in the area. And you, you have to be fluid and be able to make those decisions. And that's, I think, very similar to trading, that uh, you have to make some quick decisions sometimes. Uh, you may come in with an idea in the morning of what you want to do and why you want to do it. Well, somebody throws a monkey wrench at you very quickly, and you have to be able to make that, uh, that adjustment. So I think, that, I think there's a great similarity between what a pilot pilot has to do and what a trader has to do. Mm -hmm. I love it. Love it. I'm looking forward to reading that book. While we're on the topic of uh, the brain, uh, one, one of the articles, you know, I was just looking through your guys' site and uh, I was reading one of the articles and it was mentioning how you, when people are told that like, hey, you have to work out, you know, your health's bad, you need to work out. Like no one questions that, right? We know physical health is good. But when we talk about maybe um, brain activity, brain exercise, people are a little more hesitant um, I believe probably trading in itself is probably exercise for the brain. Are, are there any, uh, you know, Jim, are there any brain exercises that you personally do or any recommendations you would have uh, for the listeners? Well, number one, when I got on to the importance of the brain was many years ago, I used the word mentally tough, but it was a, a, a book and the name of the book was mentally tough. And uh, I think the author still has an institute down in, down in Florida. But they were working with uh, two very different people. One was Agassi, and one was one of the world's famous uh, chess players. And they were both doing the same thing, the same exercise. And what it, what it is, is what they claimed in the book, that the brain uses about 23% of our energy. And they found when the tennis player and the chess player, when they were faltering late in either a match or a game, it was that loss of loss of energy. So I think that's very, very relevant. Um, and so that's but the other thing I do, um, and it's silly, but there's a I'm, I'm forgetting the name of the game right now. Um, it's one of these games where you it's a kind of solitaire. Uh, but you're trying to line the cards up all into one into one suit. I, uh, you're moving around from six or seven different rows. But 
I find that I can do that almost intuitively now. Where it used to take me maybe 15, 20 minutes to play a game, I can now do that in maybe maybe a minute and a half, two minutes. And you get to the point where your intuition is at work and you you just see things. You don't even, sometimes you don't even realize that you're seeing it. And I think that's, uh, that is an exercise that I do, um, not deliberately. I stumbled across it, killing time so that, uh, you know, I didn't get in trouble as a trader. And I realized it had uh, additional benefits to it. I like it. I, I yeah, th this type of stuff fascinates me um, as well. And yeah, I mean, I, you know, we just want to optimize, uh, optimize our performance. You know, it makes me think too, Jim, because uh, I, I have a, I come from a poker background um, and there's this poker, I mean, he's got to be in his nineties. Uh, he's called the godfather of poker, Doyle Brunson. I, 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 oh, I'm sure. Wow. Yeah. He's, he's still, he still plays to this day. Um, some of the highest stakes in Vegas. And um, that's what he always credited poker with his longevity, just keeping his brain active, he, you know, um, and I know there's studies on this that, you know, uh, just keeping the brain active, doing these like puzzles, you know, poker's a big puzzle trading. You could, you know, these, these activities keep you, just keep you young, keep your brain active. Um, and I love it. Um, Jim, I want to, you know, I, uh, sometimes I like to ask miscellaneous questions to guests. We got football starting today. Uh, I know you're an Illinois, Chicago guy. Are, are you a Bears fan by any chance? Well, you know, I live in Arizona. I live in Prescott, Arizona now. And, okay. uh, uh -huh. I've I've converted to a Cardinals fan. Okay, oh, okay. So. I, mean, I still watch the Bears, but I I have I've made the conversion to being a Cardinals fan. Okay, okay. So I might have to switch the question up. I was gonna uh, the the Bears over under was six and a half wins this year. Uh, I was gonna ask you over under. I guess I'll ask you the Bears and let me look up the Cardinals over under. What, what do you think about the Bears this year? I have not. I hadn't looked. Yeah, you know, I haven't. I haven't gotten. I just came back from. Uh, a trip to Spain and Portugal and into Canada and uh, and I'm off to Italy and Switzerland next week oh, and awesome. I really haven't focused in fact I just was I listened to the news this morning and they reminded me that the, the Rams and Buffalo open the season tonight yeah so, yeah I'm, a, I'm excited I'm a big football fan I love football a lot um uh so traveling a lot that's awesome do you uh I'll ask you this. Well, how about a favorite um, place uh, to visit uh, in the world you've been to? I think the most recent place that I enjoyed more than anything was Barcelona. Okay. And uh, I, I love the excitement. I love the architect. I love the people. But I was there was one thing that really fascinated me. We went to the uh, um, oh, I just drew a uh, Picasso Museum for his early ages oh, wow. and there was there were like 27,000 some of them were postcards that the family home was in Barcelona at, at that point in time and it covers up his life up until the time he, he got into cubism but it was fascinating because the learning process that he went through he had a lot of instructors but he never finished with any of them because he outgrew each one of them before the course was over. He didn't put any of them down that I heard, but it was just, he was a constant learner. When you look at the postcards and the drawings, you could just see that it was a constant experimentation with what you could do and how you could express yourself. I just found it fascinating. That is, that is very fascinating. Um, uh, Jimmy, other than the markets, um, I know you, you, you find the, the brain fascinating. Is there any other subjects you're on right now that's, that's really intriguing you that you're reading about um, or anything of the like? The, uh, one of the things I'm fascinated with, you talk about football. We have a client that was a uh, major league uh, coach for 23 years, you know, worked under people like DeRocher and things. And we were talking one day and he said, Jim, when you're talking about the importance of intuition. He said, have you ever thought about a baseball outfielder and how he can catch a ball? And he said, you know, the computer can't catch that ball, but the, uh, the outfielder can make those calculations, run under the ball, catch the ball. Uh, he said, that gives you some idea of how much 
power we have stored within us. I know that's not, that's the same subject, but things like that absolutely fascinate me of what we can really do if we can break ourselves out of a mode. I used to love, I played a lot of racquetball over the years. Unfortunately, since the stroke, uh, I went from racquetball to pickleball, but it, since the stroke, that's out. So uh, I'm now doing a lot of, I'm back, I can walk about an hour a day now. So I'm back to, uh, I'm back to walking, not as fast as I used to, but I love the walking and I love the solitude. I walk around a small lake out here and I look for the, uh, for the eagles and the woodpeckers and the cormorants. Um, I find it as, at this stage of my life, I find it very soothing and I find nature to be very relaxing. Yeah, yeah, indeed. I, you know, they, um, I forget what was the book uh, I was reading in it, but it was, it was going through all like history's greats and, and like the common traits they've had. And one of it was like uh, going on long walks and, and a lot of times even just um, inspiration, good thoughts, creativity happens um, on these, you know, uh, on some walks. Um, I know Pickleball, you mentioned Pickleball. I know that's like the biggest rage right now. Um, you see that book, Praise of Walking? Oh, wow. Yeah, there you go. It's a, it's a great book. My daughter sent me that, but it's just a wonderful book. Yeah. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. No, 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 no worries. Uh, uh, Praise of Walking, that's the name of the, that's the title? Yes, by Shane O'Meara. Okay, all right, good, good, because I, lo I love I love getting the book recommendations also for the listeners as well. Um, yeah, no, I was just going to, everyone loves pickleball. You mentioned uh, uh, playing pickleball. JJ, is that, is, is pickleball, a, is that a big thing in Europe? He, he's over in London now. Yeah, so. I just moved to London. No, I, I've never really heard about pickleball at all, actually. I'm kind of, I, I'm Pickle, behind the Pickle, curve in the fads. <laughs> pickleball is the fastest growing sport in the country. Yeah, it's, really? it's crazy. Yeah, it's crazy, JJ. Yeah. yeah. And now there's a huge battle going on because they're, they're trying to make it, you know, same you know leagues with like you have in football and everything else and there's oh uh, wow there's some inner uh, there's some real conflicts going on with people trying to get control of it yeah. okay good to know Great. you know i haven't i haven't seen much uh london they're, they're still into their they're really into soccer over here boy so uh i mean i'm a bears fan uh going back i grew up in saskatchewan which is a so i i you know i grew up watching walter payton and, and mike singletary and and so i've always been a big bears fan <laughs> Yeah. I remember one time I was skiing out in Aspen and I turned to my right and Jim McMahon was standing there. Can I buy oh, you a drink? Wow. <laughs> of course, it Amazing. wasn't long uh, before everybody realized he was there. And then I quickly got shoved out of the way. But uh, <laughs> it was fun for a couple of seconds. Yeah, I think the coldest good. I've ever been was watching the Bears play Green Bay oh, on wow. a Monday night. I'm up in the top, uh, you know top of the, of the stadium, you know, which is not covered in Chicago. And I don't, I don't think I've ever been so cold or for sick for about a week afterwards. Oh, wow. But, yeah. it but was worth we it. did win. We did win, yeah. exactly. It's, it's, it's tough for me to, um, oh man, it, it's just tough being in a game under those conditions when it's like, oh, I could be in my living room. <laughs> like, watch well, it. I that's what yeah, I always I, thought. It's like kind of crazy to think about, but it's the experience, I guess, you know. Well, I grew up in Saskatchewan. So, you know, November, it's minus 25. Uh, it's it's always a good minus 25. You can hear the bones getting cracked out there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's it's so much more enjoyable. You know, Jim, I, I live down in Florida. You know, I've been here for a while, but like, you know, I'll go to the, the Dolphins games and it's just, it's comfortable. I, I can be, you know, unless it's like the summer months or, the, you know, September, it's comfortable watching a football game. But um yeah, Jim, last question. I'll let you get going. Appreciate your time. Um, if you had to choose one last meal uh, to have, what would it be? <laughs> oh, my golly. I would probably have I would probably have a filet medium rare. I uh, I eat about two steaks a year now. I just got back from my annual physical and the doctors. My golly, your cholesterol is great. I absolutely love steak. But I, I don't eat much meat. But when I have my steak every six months, I go to Roos Chris and oh, I take yeah. as, much, as much time as I possibly can to eat that steak. That's one of my favorite restaurants. Oh, yeah. It's got, it's got to make it that much sweeter. So, so uh, you said you're not eating too much meat now. How's, what's, what's the diet like these days, Jim? Oh, you know, um, I eat a lot of salads. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I, I eat salads, I eat cereals, I eat vegetables. Um, 
I ate potatoes, I ate broccoli. Uh, it's just one of those things that uh, I've got, I've formed the habit, which has really helped my, uh, my health. You know, you get conscious of the quality of life as you get over. Uh, I had a huge team, not a huge team. I had three members of my team at the Chicago Board Options Exchange, and we were all very close. All of them have left us. Uh, Joe Sullivan left us not too long ago. And you get more conscious of that every day. I got a call last night um, from the wife of a college friend, and uh, an op he'd been an ophthalmologist and worked till, uh, till he's, I think, 86. And, uh, and I just say, I think the, uh, the dietary habits, I think, have con the exercise and the dietary habits, I think, have contributed to my ability to still stay alive in front of the, tra uh, the screen every day and to be comfortable. Uh, I, I think that's a plus. It absolutely is. And it's, a, it's inspiration um, to all of us and to see you keep going and, and doing it at a high level. Um, yeah, inspirational. And so with that, it's going to conclude today's episode of Confessions of a Market Maker. If you guys enjoyed this episode, please rate and review it for us. If you'd like to join a supportive and professional community of traders, you can join us at microefutures.com. Jim, uh, let the listeners know where they can find you and anything else you'd like them to know. Well, we have some educational courses and the, the, the most important course we have is the foundational e-course. It's about a 12 hour course. You do it on your own, but it's the, it's the real foundation to everything we do. Um, we record the we record the days, and then my two partners, Jen and RJ, go back and make some really significant notations on the course. That leads you up to being able to take one of our intensives, which is our top line course. But it is a it is a prerequisite. We used to take people directly into the intensive, but we have too many repeat clients that we can't take the basic questions anymore. So. If you're really interested in what we do, the foundational e-course is the number one entree to understanding what we do and how we approach markets. Thank you. Excellent. JJ, parting words? Oh, thank you so much, Jim, for uh, being with us and uh, just just a thrill to have you with us and come back soon. We, uh, we really appreciate everything you've done. And uh, I know all the traders I teach, um, you know, I always credit you for... Uh, for you know, getting me started and, and showing me how these markets, uh, you know, how they structure out, and, and we're just very grateful. Thank you so much, JJ. Wonderful. Thank you for all the people you've referred to us over the years. Uh, my pleasure, and I'll, I'll keep doing it. <laughs> Ray, thank you. Jim, thanks so much. So for Jim Dalton, he's the gorilla of House Street. I'm Paulie Walnuts. Make sure you're using stop so. Thank you.